Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. This is Insightful Leader Live. I'm Jess Love, Editor-in-Chief of Kellogg Insight. Today, we're going to be joined by Clinical Professor of Marketing, Craig Wartman. And the topic is how to talk about your work and yourself so people listen. But first, I want to give a plug for next month's webinar. We're going to be hosting Kellogg Professor Noor Kataili. He's going to talk about uh, leadership in a politically charged age. So if you are feeling ill-equipped to navigate high stakes conversations around gender, race, religion, politics, et cetera, in the workplace, this is the webinar for you. Um, that's gonna be on Thursday, May 9th at noon central. Uh, registration is already open on our site. Next, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this webinar, we're going to do something different. We're going to keep both the chat box and the Q&A box open. Um, these are going to be for different purposes. So the chat box, which is what you're using to tell us where you're from, uh, which is wonderful, we're going to have you uh, kind of hold off on using that once you've shared where you're from. Um, and then that is going to be available uh, to put some responses to some exercises in because, yes, you'll be doing some exercises today. Craig Wartman has some work for you. Um, meanwhile, the Q&A box is going to be for questions. And as is often the case, you can upvote each other's questions. Closed captioning is available. You can access it via live transcript at the bottom of the screen. And yes, this event is being recorded. You'll get a link to it in the next day or so. All right. So you have probably been asked, hey, what do you do? What are you working on these days? A lot over the years. I certainly have been. And I've always just said whatever comes to mind. I never developed any sort of thoughtful elevator pitch for myself or my job because I kind of thought that that was for entrepreneurs or salespeople. You've got something really specific you want to get out of an encounter. Um, and Craig Wartman, my guest today, he argues otherwise. He thinks that I'm missing out on an opportunity to give a memorable first impression. So today we're going to hear his case and we're going to walk away with a lot of actionable advice. Uh, professor Craig Wartman is a clinical professor of marketing here at Kellogg. He's founder and academic director of the Kellogg Sales Institute, an operating partner at the Pritzker Group, a three-time entrepreneur and author of the book, What's Your Story? Now I want to welcome Professor Wartman. Hey, Jess, it is so good to be here. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I was watching the numbers, Jess, because when you said I'm going to assign a couple of homework, we're going to have a little bit of practice. I was hoping the numbers didn't dive deeply. Looks like we're we're holding steady. Um, look, one and all, I really appreciate you all being here. We're going to have some fun. And I'm always psyched to work with my friend Jess and the Kellogg Insights team. And we have got, uh, I hope, a really interesting chat with you. So jump into the chat. We're going to be watching that. And we're going to have a little Q&A at the end. Here we go. Jess, are we ready to do this thing? All right, let's do oh, it. We're so ready. Folks, I'm going to click a couple buttons. You know how Zoom goes. And hit play. And we are off and running. So how to talk about you and your work. And one of the ways we think about this, we, we call what we develop these courses that we develop uh, at Kellogg, at the Kellogg Sales Institute, we call them master courses. And this is one of them, one of 36 actually, called Say It Crisply, Say It Crisply. This in today's world is a superpower to the ability, the knowledge, skill, and discipline of saying things crisply is an absolute superpower. We're gonna explore why, but much more importantly, we are going to explore how. Here's how we're going to do that. We're going to do five quick turns of the track. This thing's going to go up and down really fast. So fasten your seatbelts, everybody. We're going to do, do a quick opening where we explore mindset, talk a little bit about goals for a half a second. Then we're going to dive into what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? What, it, what, what is the problem that saying it crisply, talking about you and your work in an interesting way, what's the problem that gets solved? Then we'll turn the track once again, and we'll talk about how do we actually do this? How do we achieve clarity, crispness? How do we design for energy? Those sorts of things. And then we'll turn and we'll do a little practice in these first couple. Of, and then we'll talk about boldness, humility, generosity, the, the practice of this, this combination of knowledge, skill, and discipline. How does it 
balance boldness? How does it bring in humility? And why are those things an act of generosity? And then finally, Jess and I, Jess is going to rejoin me. We're going to close this up with a q and I've got some reading recommendations and some stuff for you, um, which we're excited to tell you about as we go. So that's our run of show. The purpose of this webinar is to talk about saying it crisply and why it's a superpower. What I hope you all gain from this time with the Kellogg Insight team and me are some techniques that you can apply literally today, tomorrow, next week, and next month to acquire that superpower. How does that sound? That's our plan. Let's do it. So my friend Linda Hill at Harvard, I'm privileged to know this woman. She's a lecturer at Harvard Business School, one of our fellow sister schools. I love this quote. Talk about crisp. Doesn't matter if your intent is honorable, if your impact is not. And folks, look. We are all well-intended. We walk into rooms, we walk through the airport, we walk into restaurants, we walk into any situation where we're talking to others and communicating and leading, and our intention is honorable. But as Professor Hill says, that doesn't matter if your impact doesn't follow it. So that's what this is about. I'm gonna show you a bunch of quotes from some favorite people, she's one of them. Here's the mindset shift that's required here. And this is, not easy. So as anything we teach at the Kellogg Sales Institute, at my company, Sales Engine, this is not trivial. There's a from to here. It is catching ourselves, being ambiguous, being loose, verbose, long-winded. How might we rather shift our mindset? Dr. Carol Dweck wrote a great book called Mindset, where she says, mindset is a choice. How might I choose to be concrete, tight, concise, clear? such that I move from vagueness, sort of squishiness, to being absolutely crisp and clear. And again, we're gonna look at how that happens. We're gonna start with the foundation. I almost never fail to mention this. If those, some of you out there know me, you'll have seen this before. I'm gonna go really quickly through this. Being crisp, acquiring this superpower is a combination of knowledge, skill, and discipline. It is these three golden threads, as my friend, Professor Mushin, Suzanne Mushin, an amazing person would say, three golden threads, you weave these together. It forms a very powerful rope. And here's the thing, folks, and I'm gonna be fairly provocative throughout this webinar. You, If you know me, you know that's true. Here's the problem that one of the problems that we're trying to address with, say it crisply, with talking about you and your work. Oftentimes when you're talking to other people, you have too much knowledge. I'm going to let that just sit for a half a second because I'm sure I've provoked, I'm sure I've shocked some of you. What we don't mean, what I don't mean is get dumber, of course. What I do mean is we often over manifest knowledge and we under manifest skill, skill and discipline. Being crisp is as much a skill and discipline. In fact, I would argue it's more skill, more discipline than it is knowledge. You're trying to package something tightly. You're trying to be concise, not vague, but crisp. So what are these things? And you might think, again, this is a strange place to start, but we have to start here. Knowledge is the easy one. Knowledge is what you know. Concepts, formulas, you all know recipes, you know rules, you know processes, and those are all wonderful. Knowledge is wonderful. But then the question becomes, what is skill? And if you stop and think about that, I think a bunch of you probably are doing what I usually do when I get this question, like, what is skill? How would I define it? Here's our definition an ability acquired through sustained effort and continuous feedback to accomplish a complex task. So something of complexity that ha we have to do something is a skill. Skill is doing, knowing is knowing, skill is doing. Then last question for now, what is discipline? Discipline is choice. We think it has a one word answer. Psychologists tell us we make hundreds of choices every single day. Most of them are unconscious to us. The act of being crisp is about making choices. When someone asked me in a job interview, Craig, tell me about yourself. I have a choice. Should I go all the way back to my childhood? How far back do I go? Should I list a disconnected, you know, a somewhat connected timeline of events in my career? I would say, nope, not interesting. That's the over manifestation of knowledge. How about a different choice? What if I'm crisp and clear and very concise such that I say a couple intriguing things, 
and they ask me a question and now we're having a conversation rather than me talking at them. Now we're having a conversation. These are choices. We believe these are disciplines and skills manifesting knowledge. So that's the foundation on which we all stand. We're moving fast, folks. Let's get to the problem. What is the problem we're solving with this webinar? At least I hope starting to solve with this webinar. I came across this question relatively recently and it just blew my mind. And so I wanted to ask you as a way into the problem. Think about your life. You probably have in front of you, well, you undoubtedly, because we're on Zoom, you have a computer in front of you, a laptop. You also have a phone. Some of you have multiple phones, at least two. When's the last day that you were without a device? In other words, I would argue, how many years has it been? How many years has it been? It's a tough question, right? And it leads us to a problem that saying it crisply starts to solve. On average, you and I speak 16,000 words a day, 16,000 words. And I don't, I don't stand before you saying that that is a bad thing. That's just the median. That's the average that we speak a day. We speak the mean of 16,000 words a day. And that's a lot. And the, if you take that, just that average, and you then add these two factors to it, these two facts, there is a real problem I call it a disease. And there's actually an increasing body of evidence that suggests that we are increasingly dealing with information overload. Our attention span now has been dropping like a stone for the last 25, 30 years since it's been really studied, starting sort of in the early late 1990s, early 2000s, it's now sits at 40 seconds is our median attention span. And these are getting worse, not better. This is tough stuff. This is the world in which we operate. We're all speaking a lot of words to each other, but now because of devices, and again, devices can be wonderful too, of course, we get to do this with each other all over the world. That's great, but it also does call a pro cause a problem when we're communicating with each other because we are all swimming through this rushing river of information and being able to communicate clearly is really an antidote. The antidote is crispness, it's clarity. Crispness is cutting through the noise. Notice what I'm not saying yet. I'm not necessarily saying that all of your communications have to be oop, oop, brief, tight. Not necessarily saying that. They have to be interesting. Oftentimes they have to be brief, concise, tight, but they have to cut through the noise. That's rule number one. As you create your communications for your high stakes meetings, for the places where you interact, we have to be thinking about how do I cut through the noise? What does that look like? Okay, so now we're gonna do a quick, and these are super quick exercises. I'm not gonna work you all that hard, but you're gonna feel a little heat here because this is just an odd question. Where in your week, where in your week do you need to be crisp? And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples as, as a way into our first practice session. We only have two, first practice. Here is just a very short list of situations I am in a given week where I need to be crisp. I do a lot of networking. I teach networking, so I do a lot of networking. I'm constantly learning. I'm in office hours with my amazing Kellogg students and my clients outside of Kellogg. I'm running tons of meetings. I'm doing this, I'm delivering a talk, whatever it is, live or on Zoom. I'm leading people in my company, et cetera, et cetera. I'm selling. These are situations that I'm in where I have to be crisp. Now, also ask yourself, okay, in those various situations, what kind of questions am I answering that demand crisp answers? And these questions that I've got listed here might strike you as odd. I assure you they're not. How are you? Could you design a crisp answer to that question that has a little bit more energy than just, I'm fine. Could you do that? The answer is, of course you can. Do you ever get asked, what do you do? You probably get asked that at least once a day, if not, you know, or, or, or more. So you get asked this question all the time. What's your idea? How should we proceed? What would you do about this? What's the biggest problem you're seeing in the industry right now? All these questions can be answered very, very crisply. So let's do this. I've got my watch here. I'm ready to put it on for one minute. This is going to go up and down really, really quickly. Just think about three situations 
in the next week that you're going to be in. So quick situations, label them. Are you going to be networking next week? Are you going to be in a meeting tomorrow? That's fairly high stakes. Are you going to be meeting with your boss's boss's boss? Are you going to be dating? Whatever demands crispness, write them down, go. I'm putting my watch on at one minute. This is going to go really fast. Write them down, capture them in the chat. Please capture them in the chat too, if you would. All right, are you getting a few? Try to get three. These should bubble up fairly quickly. We're halfway there. All right, a few more seconds. I got way behind in the chat, so I'm scrolling. Okay, this is great. Pivoting a conversation, love it. Networking, board of director visit I saw fly by on the screen. Awesome. Leading a business call, meeting with a new partner. You're darn right. Yeah, Jennifer, a one-on-one. -on -one. Sophia, yes, Vac a vacation. I love that. I love vacation. Oh, God, there goes my watch. Okay, so... So now, folks, on, on a, I know you did this in the chat for us, and I appreciate that because these are this is the wisdom of crowds happening, a strategy meeting, final planning, audit committee, yes, yes, and yes, licensing negotiations. These are places where we need to be crisp. And what I want you to do is also write these down for yourself. If you're scrolling through the chat like I am, take some of these great ideas from other people and say to yourself, okay, I am going to make a choice, discipline, to get really crisp for that audit committee, for that board of directors meeting, for that sales meeting. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be very, very crisp. And that's the challenge ahead. Now notice what we haven't answered yet. We're still at the situation, we're still at the situation stage. Now we gotta jump into, okay, fine, Craig, how do you do this? And here we have some ideas. They are mostly around disciplines. The discipline, the main discipline of being crisp is distilling, distilling, distilling. Run your language, run your comms, your plan, your PowerPoint decks, whatever. Run them through a series of filters. And we have a tool to give you that I will speak of in a little bit. We have a tool to give you to help you do this. It's more of a mindset and it's, a, it's the mindset of, of crispness embodied in a tool. So how do we do this? Well, you've all heard this quote. This amazing guy said, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. And so the first one thing, the thing that I want to say to you as we get into the how of this, not the why, but the how, is that you know, I just want to be direct with you all. This is not easy. It's hard to write a short letter. It's hard to be crisp in a board of directors meeting when there's a lot you want to say. We are all smart, sophisticated people. We have what psychologists call the curse of knowledge. Someone asks a question, even what do you do? And our mind, our, our, our brains are crowded with information. And the, the, the process of distilling something down is the process of getting to something that is clear and crisp. So this is the superpower. One of the things that the information exposure and our attention spans falling like a stone, one of the things that they create is we have a very hard time, you and I, dealing with ambiguity. There's so much coming at us it's much of it is disconnected. And then we get together and I say too much, I'm actually causing ambiguity. How might we absorb ambiguity and make it who we are, what we're doing, what we're working on, very, very clear for people that will then trigger the next question. And one of the questions I get when we, when we teach this master course from people is, Craig, you're, you're, getting, you're trying to get us all the way so crisp and that's like all we're saying, it's not enough. And I never said this is all we're saying. So yeah, it's not enough, but you're giving someone a gift by saying it clearly by absorbing ambiguity. And that opens up the possibility. It energizes the conversation rather than shuts it down. Cause I'm now just, I'm washing you down in information. You're like, oh my God, what is this guy talking about? That kills the energy of a conversation. So you notice I keep using this word energy. Crispness is, crispness is not just clarity, but as my the amazing friend and teaching partner, Professor David Schoenthal would say, he, he uses the term design energy. And I think that's the right term here. A Christmas doesn't have to be two words or one sentence. 
crispness can also be energy. And let me show you an example of this. What is the most common question you get asked in your entire life? How are you? Do you have an answer? And I know, you know, there's 2,000 people here like, yeah, uh, yes, Craig, I have, a, yes, I have an answer. And I know you have an answer. And it is usually a one-word answer or two words. I'm fine. How are you? And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. But why be fine? Why be good when you can be great? Why say fine or I'm well, thank you, if you can give it some energy and start a conversation on a much more energetic, elevated platform? So my friend Jess is here. So, so Jess, you and I see each other, you know, walk in the, walk in the halls at Kellogg a bunch of times, and you're always fan, fantastic to talk to. Um, would you just quickly ask me how I'm doing? Oh, Craig, it's so good to see you here today. How are you? I am well, Jess. Thank you for asking. I'm, uh, I'm working on three or four of the most interesting projects I've ever worked on in my career. So Jess, I'm, I'm tired, but I'm having fun. And then wow. I would say, how are you? And, and in the interest of time, Jess and I are not going to play out this entire conversation. I noticed, Jess, as I was waiting for your, for your question, how are you? That someone in the chat said, you know, too much energy can be off-putting. That person is absolutely right. That caught my eye because I got my right eye. I looked at the chat every once in a while. You're right. That can be, uh, or as Leopoldo says, too, too, too much information. Yes, there is a balancing act here. But what I'm trying to correct for here is, and, and notice this is this is contradicting, not, not contradicting, but this is, you may be thinking like, there's a tension here, Craig. You're saying, say it crisply. Now you're going from fine to this, a couple sentences. And the answer is yes, because I want you to be interesting. When you're talking about you and your work, I want there to be energy there. Too much energy is too much energy. I absolutely agree with that person. TMI, maybe, maybe not. What I'm correcting for is you being boring. I'm fine. How are you? That's just boring. There's nothing there. It's just, it's just a whole lot of nothing. Why be boring when you can be interesting? And look, you'll judge this on its merits if this is interesting or not. I use this as a designed answer to how am I? Every word of this is true. So it's completely authentic. It's authentic to me. Sometimes if you're a more subdued person, I turn down the dial of energy a little bit. Sometimes if you're like my friend Jess and you're, you're pretty high energy yourself, I'll turn it up a little bit. We'll have a little bit of fun because the fun starts now. The energy starts now. And so this is something you can do. And by the way, as Jess said in her lovely introduction to me, I wear a lot of hats. So I have a designed answer to the different hats I wear. They're generally the same, but they're a little bit different because I want to have the conversation. I want to design a conversation to be interesting. And I do believe that this still qualifies as crisp. It's just crisp, interesting. It's crisp energy. How about the next one? How about the second most common question you get asked in your entire life? What do you do? Once again, do you have an answer for this? And again, I know you do. I've been teaching this for a long, long time. I call this at my sales engine company, we call this a sales trailer. It's the movie trailer of you. This is the second most common question you get asked. This is actually the first real question you get asked because we often do, how are you like we breathe? And again, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with saying, how are you? But we often do that like we're breathing. This is actually the first real question you get asked. Oh, what do you do? And the, 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 the answers tend to cluster too much or too little. And here's how Christmas can really help. So too little is, I'm a professor. It's boring. I mean, it's accurate, but it's not super interesting. I run a company, I run a sales consulting firm. I'm a consultant. I'm a professor. So that's too little. Or I tell, try to start telling you my life story and I get lost in the rotation of it. So I'm a professor at Kellogg. I've been at Kellogg seven years. I absolutely enjoy it. I run, so I run something called the Kellogg Sales Institute and within the Institute we do, and I just keep going. And that is a mistake we make. We make one of those two mistakes. It's too little and you're not giving any energy to it or giving somebody the gift of telling them actually what you do, or you're saying too much 
And now you're way over your skis. You're over manifesting knowledge. So again, if, you know, Jess and I were meeting for the first time, we're at the airport, we're wherever. And she said, so Craig, so, you know, how are you? I said, three or four most interesting projects. She's like, oh, what kind of projects? What do, what do you do? I said, Jess, I run a company called Sales Engine. We help people build and tune their sales engines. And again, folks, you should be judging everything I'm saying right now. Like it, don't like it. That's okay. It uses a metaphor. I actually know nothing about engines but I know a lot about sales engines. And so I just have a little bit of fun with this. It's just a little bit to dig your teeth into. It's a little bit of crispness with a little bit of energy to it. And, it's a, and we believe that it's a good balance between saying too much, because I could talk a lot about my company. I can talk a lot about Kellogg. I love these things I get to do. I'm so lucky. And I can design all that in, but I don't, because you haven't asked for that. You simply ask me what I do, but how might I create something that is more interesting? One of my all-time favorites, and this language is thanks to Professor Schoenthal, thanks to David, uh, so I give him full credit for this, but he has completely crafted my answer. And if you look to the lower, so the middle right, so David and I teach an executive MBA course at Kellogg called Phase Zero. And when I'm in a Kellogg context, if I'm walking through a business school or the, you know, our business school or at a conference for education, people will say, you know, Craig, what do you do? And I say, I'm a professor at Kellogg or my partner, David Schoenthal and I teach a course that demystifies the fuzzy front end of starting businesses. And I just love that statement. Almost always, and you have to take my word for this folks, but almost always that gets a smile. And notice where we are in a conversation. And I'll say it even more boldly. Notice where we are in a relationship. We're 30 seconds into a relationship, maybe 15 seconds into a relationship, and I'm already crisp. Hopefully crisp, energetic, and interesting in my answer to how are you, and just super crisp, but has a little bit more than I'm a consultant in my what do you answer to what do you do. This is the process to get there. We have to distill these down. I'm gonna run through these couple more examples because I wanna to get to some Q and A because I know you've got questions because I can see them coming in. So, you know, if there's a problem, you know, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about sales and just notice the language in the upper right. And maybe no, none of you would ever say this, but I bet you've said things like this. I have, right? Well, we need to, you know, Jess, today we need to discuss the multivariate uh, reasons for decline in sales, blah, blah, blah. When I can just say, Jess, sales are down. Let's figure out what to do. And did you notice that little pause in there? One of the things that we don't have time to talk about, but it's here, it's always here, is the power of the pause. What crispness enables you to do is draw people in with silence. There's no silence in, we need to discuss the multiple variables, blah, 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 blah. And look, that's okay, it's good, it's just not great. Rather, Jess, sales are down. Let's you and I figure out what to do. Or I'm in a job interview with Jess. Jess is the hiring boss. She says, Craig, tell me about yourself. I have a choice to make. I can go all the way and wind all the way through my history, which by the way, that's what most people do. Don't be most people. And I just gave an example here. I believe that my particular strengths would be a great addition to your team, Jess. One strength I have, blah, blah, blah. Or... You can make a different choice. You could distill that same thing down into some better language, tighter, cleaner, clearer. I think I'm a great fit, Jess, for two main reasons. First, I learn quickly. Second, I take coaching really well. And then you do this, because it lets her back into the conversation. She is going to ask you the next question. With the first one, she may or may not. I mean, she probably will, because it's a job interview, she's kind of obligated. But if we do what most people do and go all the way through the history and then we finally get to, you know, I have a couple of strengths and I want to share them with you. And when I'm on project and I just talk, 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 it gets vague and squishy. Okay, second practice. We're going to do this really fast, less than three minutes. Let's go back a half a step to the answer. What do you do? Because this is something that you get asked probably every day, every other day. Take a shot at this. Try to brainstorm an interesting answer. And once again, we would love to have you post it in chat. I'm going to ask Jess and the team to share a couple of your examples because I bet we're going to get some great ones here. 
brainstorm a more interesting answer, write it down for yourself, absolutely, and then write it down in the chat or write it down in the chat and take a screenshot, okay? Go, three minutes, go. Put my watch on again. And I'm behind in the chat again, so I'm gonna catch up to you. All right, Fernando, that's a good start. Love it. I design organizations, that's interesting. Holy crow, these are coming in. A doctor for companies I saw. I like that one. I like that one, a doctor for companies. I fight cancer, wow, I dig that. Mm. These are really coming in fast. I can't read quite that fast, but they're super great. There's some really good ones here, and I'm glad to see this. It's so interesting, you all. I'm going to give you another minute and a half to do this. It's so interesting. When we have done this over you know, 15 years or so in a classroom, people really struggle with this. Corporate clients struggle with this. I was on the East Coast yesterday teaching part of this and a bunch of other stuff. And it was a big, huge pharmacy company that you know. And one of the women smiled when I got to this point. She said, I just tell people I sell drugs. And she said, it always gets a smile and it always gets an interesting conversation. It never fails me. Now, uh, once again, to the comments in the chat earlier, you know, your, your personality has to be designed to, to, you know, to take that risk. Of, of doing something like that, but it looks like a lot of you are. I do worry about, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm judging things that I haven't really thought through. So I'm being very honest with you all. Some of these are pretty darn long. What I would do, and I'm going to show you a way to do this. What I would do is take these posts and distill them down even farther. Try to use metaphors, I'm a doctor for companies. Try to use interesting language that people won't hear every day. Those are ways you can add a little of what Professor Schoenthal calls design energy to your Christmas. Okay, they're still coming in hot and heavy. This is great. I fulfill my clients' dreams. That's a really interesting one. I'm sure that a whole bunch of you on this Zoom would never find yourself saying that. And again, that's fine. But give yourself the chance, take, I, you, I, I'm, I'm going to say this later as we wrap up for questions, embrace the risk of being interesting. Embrace the risk of being different. I help people fulfill their dreams. I'm a doctor for companies. I help machines and humans understand each other. Natalia, that's awesome. Okay, Jess, I'm coming to you again, my friend. What did we get here? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to uh, catch fish through the same quick moving stream as you, but I did pluck out a pretty a couple good ones. Good. Um, I liked, I cool down the oceans. That's a good one I would want to oh. ask. I create things that don't exist. I reimagine outdoor spaces. I build cool places to live. I bottle attorney's knowledge for future use. I mean, I'm intrigued by that. Great metaphor. I'm the future of work, building access for black and brown communities, one relationship at a time. Oh, love that phrase. I help people 50 and up, sit up and sort out their career future. I make bioscience understandable. These are fantastic. Jess, thank you for, for capturing something. I missed, I missed all, every single one you just, you just uh, said. So uh, I see one just coming in. Uh, I, uh, it already passed me, uh, mergers and acquisitions. I'm gonna press on you all. That's not an answer to what do you, what do, you do? And, and, and maybe it is for this person, but I, I would say that's not, that's not an answer. Give it some energy. What about M&A do you do? And I think Jess, your examples from this team are fantastic. I'm so glad we got these because folks, these are ideas for everyone. What we just ask you to do, I'm just gonna put a label to it. What we just ask you to do is to build a prototype. And what I would suggest that you do, what we know about teaching entrepreneurs and what we know on the research on great entrepreneurs, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, doesn't matter. What we know, we can borrow from entrepreneurs. What the best ones do is what David and I say in our course, they build a prototype and they take it for a spin. 
And what I'm suggesting with these situations and where you need to achieve crisp crispness is that you build a prototype and take it for a spin. I cool the oceans. Yes, that's a great prototype. And look, when you take it out, if it's TMI or people look at you weird or they're horrified by it or you get bad feedback, then build a different prototype. I bet that'll work though. I bet it'll work the way that you want it to and I bet it will surprise you. Here's the other way to think about saying it crisply. Why wouldn't you be the person in my day that I think about at the end of the day, like I met some woman named Jess Love and she said she cools the oceans. I would probably tell my family about that at the end of the day. Why wouldn't you want to be that person? And does this take some tolerance of risk? You bet. Anything in life worth doing takes some tolerance of risk. So why not do it? Okay, let's keep going. We've got one more turn of the track to do, and then we're going we're gonna to close up for questions. So we've got to practice this. And we did just a couple of practice sessions just to get the juices flowing. What we try to always design into our learning at Kellogg and at Sales Engine is what we call little F failures, little F, not big failures. But when, you, when I probably asked you, you know, how would I answer the question, how are you in a more interesting way? Well, you probably felt a little tension, right? That's a little, it makes it like a little burn. Like, wait, what? He's so weird. Why would I do this, right? And you felt a little bit of heat. That's good, right? We have to practice. Practice is all about getting the muscles to fatigue. But we get such benefits from this. This is probably my all, not probably, this is my all-time favorite quote. I wouldn't give a fig for simplicity on this side of complexity, but I'd give everything my, I own for simplicity on the other side of complexity. Folks, this is what we're after. We're all smart. We all accumulate knowledge and accumulating knowledge is a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing, full stop. But when we over manifest knowledge, when we're loose or vague or clipped, that's a problem. It's not a lack of knowledge. It's, a, it's the reverse. It's the over manifestation. What we need to develop to get through complexity to the other side to simplicity is tremendous skill and discipline. Now, if you're looking at this on a phone or a screen, you're going to be horrified. But here's my promise, Jess and mine and uh, amazing Kellogg Insight team. We're going to email this to you. So this is a tool that we built for, um, for our ability to distill things down and say it crisply. And here, I'm just gonna point you to, it's a two pager. There's a worksheet on the back page. There's a couple of examples on the front page. And what we're gonna, what, what I wanna point your eye to are the clocks. So one of the ways yes, I see in this chat, a simple tool, uh, it actually is very simple if you wanna take a look at it. So you'll see the clocks. Uh, Professor Carter Cast and I worked, worked this sort of image up a while back and then had a designer draw it out for us. Think about it this way. You're going to be in a situation next week, all those situations that you captured early on today in the chat, and you're going to have an opportunity to say your piece. And oftentimes that starts with too much. Remember Twain, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. So what you can do is exercise the muscle by, flex the muscle by writing down for the high stakes things you're going to do, or even the answer to what do you, what, what do, you do, you can write down your typical answer, then by just looking at the stopwatch, you know what we're asking you to do. Now cut it in half, distill it down. Now distill it down even more. And then I hope what I've done in the last 15 minutes or so, I drip some extra secrets to you. Make it interesting. Give it some energy. Use a metaphor. Make room for silence. So if you think about this, and I want to lead us into boldness and humility, and then we're going to take some questions. So if I blow this simple tool up, what you've seen, what you're seeing now is a question, is a job interview question. If I said to Jess, now I'm hiring, and I said to Jess, you know, Jess, um, tell me about yourself. That's your typical job interview question. You're all going to answer that question a million and a half times in your life. Well, the typical person might say something like at the top, and I'm not going to read this to you, but if you, did, if you measured, if you said this at a normal speaking cadence, it's 30 seconds. And then I said to myself, okay, if I'm that, if I'm this person, how would I distill that down? And so I took out a bunch of stuff. I got it down to 15 seconds. But now what I want, I'm going to change the framing on you a little bit. 
Because you're probably thinking, Craig, you would really distill a question, tell me about yourself into that tiny little answer at the bottom. Yes, I would. Because that is an act of boldness and humility. Jess says, Craig, you know, I've learned so much at Facebook. I'm grateful for that experience. Competing with the likes of Google and TikTok, I'd maybe a better leader. I think I'm a great fit here for two main reasons. First, I learn quickly. And second, I take coaching really well. And then she stops. Most of you, I would bet, are saying to yourself, this is not enough in an answer to a question. It's too little. I disagree because being crisp is both boldness and humility. And those are magnetic qualities in you. I'm hiring you because I want you to be bold, but I don't want you to be arrogant. So how do you design in boldness and humility? Here's how you do it. Jess says to Craig in an interview, Craig, you know, I've learned so much at Facebook and I'm grateful for that experience. When you use a word like grateful, that's humility. She follows it with, you know what? Competing with the likes of Google and TikTok made me a better leader. That's humility. And then she finishes strong. I think I'm a great fit here, blah, blah, blah. That's boldness. Tell people why you're the fit. And... For those of you who are still thinking that's not enough, man, this is not enough. I would just say to you, she can't, I, I can't help asking her the next question. I'm intrigued. Like, what? talk to me, Jess. Talk to me about this. You're drawing people towards you. One of our favorite words at Sales Engine at the Kellogg Sales Institute is the word magnetic. Draw people towards you with crispness. I promise you, they will ask you the next question. Think about the metaphor of a mixing board. The big dials are, there are three big dials, knowledge, skill, and discipline. When you're being crisp, dial down the knowledge for now and up the skill and discipline. So a way to think about this is the knowledge is, and you already did this work. You already did it today. Know your situations, know your audience. What does Jess need to know versus what does Pam Ocampo need to know? What does Randy Paulson need to know? Know your audience. Those are knowledge things. Knowledge is hugely important. But don't forget skill and discipline. Skill is cut the right stuff, not the wrong stuff. Cut it again. Leave only the key points. And then discipline. Choose clarity. Embrace risk, which is risk here is differentiating yourself, being different. That is an act of generosity in a noisy, distracted world. Okay, last point. And Jess, you and I are going to head to questions here in a second. What do you get from doing this? What accrues to you? Well, you're the person that becomes known in your company or in, in your circle as the one who absorbs ambiguity. You know, for some reason, Jose, John, Randy, Pam, they always make it just, they, they like absorb ambiguity. They just make everything so clear. I love hanging out with Pam and, and, and Jose because he just makes it so clear. It also makes you memorable. It makes your ideas portable. Remember, you can't carry around a 10,000 pound thing, but you can carry around a one pound thing. So make it portable by being crisp. You also become inspirational. This is an outcome that accrues to you. And the most important outcome is you're different. You're the one that stands out. You're the one that breaks through. Okay, as we turn to questions here, I wanna offer some readings. And once again, I wanna repeat something I said. So Jess and the Kellogg Insight team, when they package this up, this video, they're going to send it along with an email, uh, send it along in an email with that tool that I showed you. So you can just, you know, print that out, put it on your laptop. So you've got it. Reading recommendations. I have three favorites. The Art of Explanation, which is by a journalist, a former journalist. Uh, my friend Joe McCormack in Chicago, another Chicagoan, um, brief, fantastic book. And a book I read relatively recently called Weekend Language, which talks about something I've not talked about, which is plain language. Don't say multivariate when you can say sales are down. <laughs> Just say it. Just speak plainly. Finally, I post a lot of stuff. I have been having some interesting a couple of years. And so I've been posting a lot on resilience on LinkedIn. If you like or value any of this stuff, please join me on LinkedIn. I'd love to see you there. We have a darn vibrant community. I'm so thankful for that. Finally, before we go, I'm not going yet, but I do want to say thank you because we're going to end this uh, fairly quickly, but not until we've taken some questions. 
Um, and it looks like the chat is just is, is 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 going. And Blake, thanks for for posting the LinkedIn link. Please hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm so thankful for all of you. Let's do questions. And I know you know one of the rules of thumb that we always operate by at both Sales Engine and Kellogg Sales Institute is you end meetings either a couple minutes early or on time. Given that this is a webinar, we're going to run pretty close to the time, but we wanted to end with questions. I know you're all busy. You're getting back to your mornings, evenings, or afternoons. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us, Jess. Let's you and I talk about questions. What do we got? All right, sounds good. Um, and for folks who are entering their questions now is the time to switch over to that Q&A box if you haven't already, because it seriously is like catching fish if it is in the chat box. Um, so we had a number of questions uh, come in during the webinar and I'm sure we're gonna get a few more as well. But a lot of people pointed out that um, your kind of original example about how are you, um, he, at least you know here in the United States, it's pretty common for that to be a throwaway question, but we had a number of people point out that in other cultures, that's not necessarily the case. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about cultural differences in the crispness that we expect in how that might be interpreted. Have you gotten any feedback from maybe attendees of your class in the past from different cultures who have said, mm, this might work a little bit differently you know, in, in this situation where I'm from? You, you bet, Jess. And, and folks, I don't, I don't know if I have an entirely satisfying answer there. I wanna start by an acknowledgement that is gonna be obvious to all of you. I am an American. I, I learned how to lead and sell and communicate in the United States. From a very uh, in my my start of my career, a very American company called IBM. So so there's that. I can't get out of my own skin. So I just want to acknowledge that. Second, there are some great resources for this. So there's a great great book that I read called The Culture Map, which really helped me understand the differences. So that's that's just another. You know, I know I've given you a lot of homework. I'm a professor. I can't help myself. The third thing, maybe maybe a little bit more helpful helpfully is you know. There, there are differences. And so in some cultures that I have taught and, and spent time in, the answers to questions like, what do you do, have to be very functional because doing anything else would be off-putting. And again, this is where my Americanness sort of fails me because you, and I put it straight back on your shoulders, I'm not going to be helpful here because you have to know that. You're from that culture or you're operating that culture, go get the culture map, read the book, figure it out. But I'll just give you an example. I was teaching in the Middle East and I was teaching a, a version of this. And at some point I said something and they all started laughing. And I thought, oh boy, here I go. I've gotten in trouble. I've said something stupid, which I routinely do. And they said, Craig, your answer, your how are you is really interesting. And I said, you're laughing. What's wrong with it? Just be honest with me. I can take it. Be direct. And they said, no, no, no. It's interesting. In the, in the Arab culture, it's not enough. And I said, wow, tell me more. And they said, we want a lot more there. We do business based on how I understand you as a person, your family, your family relations. And I, you know, my reaction as an American was, that's lovely. That's so super cool. And they said, so you just kind of apologize for spending a little bit more time in the answer. How are you? We want a lot more time. And then I get on a plane and I go to Asia and it was different for some countries in Asia. So it was much more like, no, be a little bit more functional, Craig, not as, not as sort of, don't, I wouldn't design in that energy. So again, there's a range of things and there's some really great books like the culture map that are emerging to help us deal with these things as we become, which is great is the world's getting smaller where we can all be with each other. I mean, I saw Mumbai, I saw all kinds of places in this chat today, which just warms my heart. So I hope that's helpful. Again, I'm, I'm mostly putting that back on your shoulders. Well, Jess it seems like my, my best guess is that you're your response might be similar if we're talking not necessarily about um, other international cultures, but even like here in the States, different companies, different organizations can also have different cultures. Do you, do you think that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I got it. So just a quick aside, side story, Jess and you all. So speaking of different cultures within the United States, I was in Texas the other day and I said to someone, bless your heart. And I didn't know this as a Midwesterner, but bless your heart is often like you're put, you're pushing somebody off your set. You're kind of tapping on my head, like, good try. Bless your heart. Instead of what I meant was bless your heart. That's really nice of you to say. They were like, looked at me like, uh oh. So I had a moment just even in the United States going a thousand miles. Um, so 
I'm going to switch topics here. Uh, we had an interesting question. How can we transfer some of the tips that you gave us today to written communications? Are there different rules or do you approach an email in a similar way? Uh, so we have a, another master course on writing. So and this is hard for me because this is a, a whole other webinar and a whole other master course and workshop. Let me just steal a, a couple of things. And I, I would say it is it is a first cousin to what we're doing right now. Jess, sorry, my watch is going off again. It's the it's the first cousin to what we're doing now, writing. So um, we spend 28% of our time, you and I, on average, 28% of our week reading emails. So this is another, this is the same body of research that taught us that the average words we speak a day is 16,000. So we spend a lot of time reading. How might you be generous, bold, and humble in your written communications? So again, if I have a higher stakes email that I need to send, and I'm gonna do two, I'm gonna give two answers, Jess. One on email, just fast communications. Once again, be very, be very concise, crisp, and clear. Use metaphor, take half out, take half out again. Because again, if that person is interested in what you need to, in need to say, they will foster a longer conversation. In other words, you will earn the right to a longer conversation with a briefer email. One of the mistakes we made and one of the reasons we spend 28% of our week reading emails, which is insane, is we put ways like, oh, Jess needs to know all this stuff. No, she doesn't. That's just me being undisciplined. That's me being Mark Twain writing a long one because I don't have time to write a short one. That's on me. That's not Jess. And my, my dear friend and teaching partner, Tiana Clark, Professor Clark at the Kellogg Sales Institute, one of our newer members a couple of years ago, she's amazing. She has this great line. She says, you know, you know what's, and I'm going to twist it for this eventuality. She says, what's arrogant is expecting that people are thinking about you. Because she, she'll say, you need to be bold and talk about your accomplishments. And, he, and then she says, you know, that's because people say, well, isn't that arrogant? You're being bold and talking about your two main strengths. And she says, no, what's arrogant is thinking people are just going to be thinking of sitting there thinking about you. And I apply that to writing as well. What's arrogant is I think Jess is going to wade through three paragraphs of my stuff. No, I have to distill it down. That's one. The second one, longer form communications, a trick that we have for long in my company sales engine that we have for longer form communications. Let's say we do a five page report. We actually, the last step is, we, so we, we do all that stuff. We try to make it really tight, but there's a lot we have to communicate. We make it very visual with pictures. And the last step we do is we send it to our designer. Now she makes it look beautiful. So there's icons, there's visual, there's color, there's bold, there's sections, there's insets. We spend the time doing that. We actually build in an extra week to get it to Nell so she can design all that. Does that take time, these things? Yep, it does. And I just want to be honest with you about that. Um, switching topics yet again. Um, I have a couple questions coming in about people uh, for whom the answer, how are you or what are you doing now? What are you working on? Is not a positive one. So for instance, maybe you are not doing well. Um, something is going on in your life. Or uh, if you have lost your job, for instance, and you are not currently working on any projects, how can you embrace some of the skills we talked about in today's webinar if maybe you're not working on three of the four most exciting projects in your career? I will give you an abstracted answer, you all. It's a great question. And I'm going to give you a really concrete example. So the, the abstracted answer, the sort of the, 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 the algorithm, if you will, is to be directly honest. If you've just lost your job, you know, and Jess, you say, hey, what do you do? And I say, you know, um, interesting that you ask. I am, I have just been caught in a reduction in force and I'm, I'm sad about it. And then what you do is add design energy that is forward motion, forward looking. You say that because that's absolutely honest and don't BS people. And then say, what's, what's the better news is I, there's two things that I am pursuing that I'm quite excited about. One and two. Because now what you're trying to do is recruit someone to help you. That's why I don't want you to finish with, you know, I'm sad or I'm bummed or I lost my job. Add some energy forward motion. So that's that's the rule of thumb. Uh, Jess knows this, you all. So concrete example. Uh, when people ask me, you know, about six months ago how I'm doing, 
here was my answer and it will shock some of you, uh, but there it is. I'm, I'm, if I'm anything, I'm real. I said, you know, I've had an interesting year. Um, about six months ago, I lost my leg to cancer. So I am working on understanding the nature of resilience. And what's interesting is I'm having a lot of fun because I'm actually learning a lot and it's helping me on an hour by hour, day by day basis. How's that for an answer? Because again, you see both components. I'm dead honest. And there's forward motion here, always forward motion. It's a compelling answer. Um, so John Register, my friend, has just chatted. My dear friend, John Register, I didn't know you were here, who is a fellow amputee. He said, legs are overrated. John, you just made my freaking day. You were the best. Um, there is a risk, uh, is one of our questions, in using the power of the pause. Could you, for instance, be talking to someone who is likely to hijack the conversation? And the question is, if you think you're in that situation, how do you own the pause? How do you kind of signal, this is going somewhere, <laughs> don't interrupt? Calmness, presence, eye contact, and Jess, those are the, those are, that's the how. Those are the, those I believe are the answers. I'm going to go back to the first thing you said. I actually disagree with that. I mean, can someone, if I pause, can someone hijack the conversation? Of course they can. Of course that's going to happen. But I'm going to keep pausing. What's my alternative? In other words, what's my discipline? What's my choice? I'm just going to raise my volume and talk at you. That's not going to be constructive. So I'm going to stay in the question. I'm going to stay in the pause. I'm going to stay present and I'm going to hope that me modeling the right behavior calms my counterparty down. And so they get the message and look, let's take it all the way to the toughest place. If that person doesn't get the message, then I'm going to execute a different form of thing. I'm going to execute what we teach at Kellogg in another master course. I'm going to have a difficult conversation. I'm going to say, you know, you and I are, are like this. We're missing. You seem to be talking over me. I try and I'm trying to understand this is not happening. I think we should pause here. I'm going to be very direct. Um, we have really like time for one more minute from you. So I'm going to give you a little bit of, a, of, a, of an exercise yourself, uh, uh, courtesy of one of our questioners. Um, in this final minute, could you give us an example of a boring and a crisp answer to what are your flaws or weaknesses? Sure. Uh, <laughs> this is a great question. So, uh, um, a boring answer, I'm not sure boring is the right word, but a, a, a very common answer is, you know, well, my my biggest flaws is that I I work too much and I care too much. And, and I, again, I'm being a little facetious with you all, but that is the nature of like, people say my biggest strength is I just work myself to the bone. You know, I work myself to, 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 to craziness. And it's some flavor of that because we don't wanna actually answer the question. Um, I would say, once again, this will not surprise anyone. I would be absolutely direct, lean into, lean into whatever your biggest flaw is. Um, you know, Jess, it's a great question. I'm going to be directly honest with you. My biggest flaw is I'm I'm struggling right now with time management. I have a lot going on. I'll 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 start, I'm starting to figure it out, but it's a it's a flaw. And I just want to be super honest about that. Just tell it, tell it like it is and look straight in the eye. Because what you're gaining actually in that moment of being both bold and humble is you're gaining credibility, not losing credibility. You're gaining credibility. I cannot say that strongly enough. Well, speaking of time, we are at time. Thank you so much to all of our wonderful attendees from around the world. Great questions today. Thanks, of course, to Professor Craig Wartman. And please consider joining us for Noor Kataili's webinar on May 9th, Leadership in a Politically Charged Age. Take care. Thanks, all.